Hello, glad you can join us on this episode. We've got data governance, data analytics, and emerging leaders, plus membership discount codes if you stay to the end. Hello and welcome. Let's start with some updates. Companies around the world are increasingly recognizing and reporting on sustainability risks, such as climate change, as business risk. Yet, according to Big Shift's Small Steps, a report by KPMG, disclosure gaps remain in areas including quantification of ESG impacts and in terms of the breadth of risks covered. KPMG analyzed the financial reports, sustainability, and ESG reports and websites of 5,800 companies around the globe to find that sustainability disclosure has steadily grown over the past several years. Environmental and climate issues have come into focus, but blind spots remain, particularly in the quantification of risks, with less than 20% of the companies presenting either scenario-based modeling or financial quantification of potential impacts of climate change. While the report found some encouraging trends, such as 100% of U.S. large companies providing ESG disclosures and 70% of U.S. CEOs believing that their ESG programs improve their financial performance, the report also found the U.S. lags peers in key areas. For example, only 43% of U.S. companies acknowledge climate risk as a risk to their business. Additionally, only 23% of large U.S. companies have sustainability representation at the leadership level, compared to around a third of global peers who have designated members of their board or leadership team responsible for sustainability matters. We'll have a link to the full KPMG report in our show notes. What happens in Las Vegas does not always stay in Las Vegas, especially if it's all the learning and solutions and, yes, fun, shared at the recent Ignite conference produced by the IIA. Let's hear about it from some folks who were there. And so coming to a conference like this, getting to hear from people who have a variety of experiences and backgrounds and auditing, that's going to be like key exposure to understanding where you want to go as you build out your career. I mean, in our profession, it's, you know, second to none to be able to network with other people here. Right. And this gives you the opportunity to network with people that you haven't been able to see in you know two, three years. So it's been a great opportunity so far. My favorite thing so far has been learning about you know new technologies, learning learning about how bots are being utilized within different processes within organizations. You know, it's something that I try to keep stay relevant on. So it really hit home for me. It gives you an opportunity to see the best practices that are out there in the audit profession and engage and connect with fellow auditors. My takeaway is uh, just the new leaders, the ta- lot of takeaways for them, for the new leaders to see, you know, how to manage a team, how to manage with the C-suite and the board and things like that. So there are a lot of valuable takeaways for, for new leaders in that perspective. I, I think it really is getting back here in person after two or three years of remote conferences, hybrid work, hybrid work. It's great to see people's faces. And new, 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 new relationships and old, right? So. Also in attendance at Ignite were many of the 2022 IIA Emerging Leaders, an ambitious group intent on sharing their knowledge and fostering the growth of the next generation of internal auditors. Uh, The LSU Center for Internal Audit came and presented what internal audit was, and it sounded really interesting, and I was like, I'll give it a shot. So I gave it a shot, and (laughs) here I am almost five years later, I guess. My first position was with a big four accounting firm, external auditing, and then I did that for about two and a half years, and the clients were amazing, and that's kind of how I pivoted into internal audit, because I used to work on their external audits. When I was in college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I tried risk management and insurance as a major at my university, and they really lean you towards that insurance side of things, and so when I continued taking those courses, there was one particular course called commercial risk management. And that's essentially what an internal auditor's job is to some extent, um, just not with the insurance side that applies. A lot of what I learned in that class really uh, geared me up to be in the role I'm in today. I had two options, right? Like I had one option of like picking 
industry. So like working for a organization um, where I could do, you know, a firm work, which is like, you know, you're at an accounting firm and you're providing essentially like consulting or advisory services. The reason why I picked internal audit was sort of like is learning about how organization work, right? Like how tiny controls can have a significant impact in, you know, organization goals and objectives um, and how control can influence staff behavior, risk management and what have you. So going to firm gives me the opportunity to work with different organizations from different industries. Making the effort to go out there, um, get to know people, <laughs> have them think that like you're there to help them. Um, you always are constantly trying to make sure that uh, that you're doing what they what they as a body, which is also really hard, <laughs> um, want you to be doing. I came out of college, I started working, I was really passionate, determined, trying to be perfect every single day. And I'd say, uh, starting with the what didn't work, realizing that when you start in this career, you're not gonna know everything. You're going to learn a lot, which I really valued. And so I initially looked at our mistakes, if you will, as, as issues, things that I really, you know, I, I took to heart. And once I realized that those mistakes were actually really just opportunities to get better and to learn and to apply my skills moving forward, that really helped me. Um, and so I guess that really turns into a positive, right? Uh, and what also worked was a lot of my involvement from an internal audit perspective when it came to the IA, when it came to my culture diversity inclusion work, um, and the relationships I built there. Because at the end of the day, when you are growing your career, the relationship you build, you don't have all of the knowledge. You don't have all of the insights. You utilize the specialized individuals who know their topic, their areas, their expertise um, to the most of your ability. And that gives your company or your clients, whomever they might be, uh, a really positive outcome when you are giving them support. Communication, networking, and then being empathetic. Really, at the end of the day, everything we do in audit is communicating either written or verbally with stakeholders, often up various chains of management, even up to the C-suite sometimes. So being able to succinctly communicate a message uh, is very important and being able to think about how a message will be received. Networking, connections are everything. Being the person that knows people and being able to find answers to problems that you have through your network that you've built over the years is just completely valuable. And then finally being empathetic. I always joke with our stakeholders, no one ever just wakes up and says, you know what, I'd like to be audited today. And think about how what we're doing impacts their job and think about how the questions that we ask and the, any observations that we raise, how it's gonna impact them. And thinking about how we communicate that message in the delivery um, can really make the difference in our, our stakeholder relationship and at the end of the day, our end product. Definitely the first one I would say is networking. Our profession is a lot about relationships and so, I found that avenue and grew that skill a bit more with my involvement in the IIA. Uh, getting involved early, being a volunteer, then being an officer, just opens up so many opportunities to meet new people, uh, learn from other people and what they do in their companies. Second of all, I would say keeping up to date with your technical knowledge is one of those big skills, staying up to date um, on those emerging trends, just because our profession constantly changes and, and there are several factors that go into our profession. And so staying up to date is crucial so that you can continue to you know, excel and improve your internal audit programs. In my case, help my clients, right? So they can have excellent and uh, up-to-date programs and the third skill I would say honestly and it seems trivial but for those who are joining especially the profession is not just your technical knowledge in terms of what's going on in the profession but Excel skills. My wife and I, we uh, <laughs> watch probably the entire Twilight series every year. Not really because we enjoy it, but because it's just kind of like fun to <laughs> go back and laugh at all those movies and how we, everybody was uh, so into them. Any Disney movie is on my top. I love Disney, so I mean, I love Encanto. 
uh, just because it also has that Hispanic heritage in the background. I have been a huge Top Gun fan uh, basically since I was a kid. I can remember growing up and watching the original Top Gun on VHS on repeat at my parents' house uh, probably every weekend. I don't know for 15 years or what it felt like that. My favorite guilty pleasure food is definitely ice cream. Uh, I live in Miami, Florida at the moment, and my wife and baby boy, when we're home and we're just hanging out together and it's hot outside and we just want to relax, sometimes a good little bit of ice cream or even a la mode, something on top. Last night, I think I had an apple pie um, with some ice cream on top. So it's my guilty pleasure and uh, I should probably stay off of it, so. Uh, pizza. I actually do like Hawaiian pizza quite a bit, so I know it's a hotly debated uh, topic, but yeah, Hawaiian pizza. It's just one of these food trucks. Uh, one of my side hobbies is to try all the breweries in Tampa because the microbreweries just kind of like exploded within the last year. So they always have really good food trucks and there's this one called Funnel Vision and it just has fried food everything. So my favorite is mac and cheese topped with fried chicken nuggets and then a bunch of sauce. So that's my guilty pleasure, but also my favorite food. <laughs> Data analytics has helped internal audit dramatically widen its scope, seeing and using more of the information in company systems. But for many small audit shops, it still seems out of reach. Not so. That's what the IIA's Robert Perez learns from Elizabeth McDowell and Adam Russell in our next segment. Thanks for joining us. So you folks did a presentation at GRC on uh, data analytics for the small audit shop. And one of the opening or, or key points to begin with is the idea that you define what data analytics is and what it isn't. How, why, why is that important, Adam? Well, I've been to several of these conferences and data analytics has been a hot topic for decades at this point, but I think a lot of times people get confused about what it is still because oftentimes it's being presented as a specific tool that's going to be able to accomplish all these tasks and it can get a bit muddied because at the end of the day it really is just exactly what it sounds like analyzing data to get to some sort of conclusion based on what it's telling you. A lot of times people think, oh, well, data analytics is ACL or IDEA or Alteryx, and that's actually not accurate. Those are very powerful tools to accomplish it, but it's not the act of doing the analysis itself. So I think it was very important to just kind of level set because the last several conferences I've been to, it's been, you know, buy this tool and we'll be able to solve all the problems, which might be true for certain shops, but it's not the actual act itself. And, and particularly for a small audit shop, why is it important to have that clarity? Because a lot of times people think they're not able to do it because there's either a resource constraint or they just don't have the time to learn this often very complex tool. So they don't even want to try to put the effort in because they don't think they'll actually be able to get the value out of it, which they could do with a lot of tools they already have readily available. Yeah. And that, that sort of leads me to my next question. Elizabeth, what are the biggest roadblocks? Is that, is it, is that part of it? One of the things that we really emphasize um, in our audit shop is building the bench strength from within and spending time doing the training um, as simple as on YouTube uh, to learn those skills for things like Power BI or Power Query. Um, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money because resources can certainly be a constraint. Um, it might cost a bit of time, but it's worth it in the end. It's a long game. And, and from your experience, when you offer those training opportunities, is it readily accepted? Folks are eager to learn? So my philosophy as a leader was really that it's expected okay. to spend an hour a week, pick the hour, pick the day, but spend an hour a week learning something new. It might be on LinkedIn Learning, it might be on YouTube, but it's really for personal development to help you and to help broaden your own skills. 
Yeah. And earlier you mentioned the idea of, of starting small. Mm -hmm. um, is there easy sort of low-hanging fruit topics that, that, that folks can grab, t and &E maybe? Or? I think that's definitely one. I think that was one that we talked about in our presentation. Um, user access, using analytics to more effectively do user access testing on the entire population. I think that's another. Adam, do you have any examples? Just going through the practice of starting with anything, like Elizabeth said, but oftentimes we chose to focus on areas that tend to be more common across organizations, travel and expense, user access, but those are areas that are going to come up in a variety of different audit topics. So just picking one thing and starting to do that consistently across all of your audits, that's going to gain that efficiency and it's going to give you that skill set to then branch out and do it in more areas as you develop those skills. And, and, and those you both seen to having that kind of short, clear, directive, consistent kind of uh, reporting uh, across that Atlanta. Anything you may want to do with that analytics. Everybody has really appreciated shorter, more concise, cleaner, crisper audit report. So we always had in our reports, the executive summary is one page. We do everything we can to keep it at one page. And there's a detail matrix that might have more information. But then in the case of the analytics, we included an appendix that they could look at, flip to the back, see the different charts and tables that we um, performed for the audit and the analytics. Yeah. And, and that is, I'm assuming, pretty critical to, to stakeholder buy-in. Yes, it's critical to stakeholder buy-in, but also really having good communication throughout the audit, um, transparency with our stakeholders, keeping them apprised of any issues that we might be seeing or really even um, the analytics that we're doing throughout the audit versus saving them for the end and surprising them with them has really helped build trust with our stakeholders. And, and, and in some ways, that it's probably a, an advantage to a smaller audit shop. It's, Absolutely. It's probably going to be in a smaller group. People are going to know you a little better. Right. The so. relationships that we are building are imperative to our success as an audit group. We have had people come and request that we do audits because they really trust us as peers um, and as advisors. And that's really exciting. Yeah, that's that's what the whole game is about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, any any closing thoughts in terms of what you would tell that CAE who's ready to take that dive? Uh, I think that you really need to, again, just start small. Um, make it manageable so that you can build that confidence. But as a CAE, one of the things I really emphasized in my presentation was to encourage your team. Give them ideas. Know what is possible. Um, as a CAE, you can't know everything. You can't know how to do everything. But know what is out there and encourage your team to go and learn and build those skills for themselves, which in turn helps them and it helps your small audit team, and it helps your organization. Excellent. Would you add anything, Adam? I would say don't be afraid of failure. I think we try to emphasize that during the presentation as well, that not everything we tried worked. There was, I don't want to use the term wasted time, but there was opportunities where we really thought it was going to work out. We spent 10, 15 hours trying to build out this analytic step, and either it just didn't work or it didn't garner the results we expected. And that's going to happen. And I think sometimes see that as a road, people see it as a roadblock and say, okay, well, this is why we don't try this. But if you do that a couple of times, then you'll still get something out of it. So the next time you run into a similar problem, you'll know, well, this didn't work maybe because of X, so we need to build out and do more with Y to get to the actual conclusion we think we need to get to. So I would just say, don't be afraid of failure. It's not gonna go perfectly right from the get-go. But to Elizabeth's point, just start small, pick a few areas where there are tons of examples already available for you on YouTube or other areas, uh, and just start there and build out from there. Thank you so much for joining me, we appreciate it. Thank you. Our pleasure. And now for a bit of challenging fun with a segment we call In Focus. Internal Auditor Magazine is the world's leading publication covering the internal audit profession. It went fully online in August of 2020. Question, what year did the magazine begin publication? Is it 1972, 1964, 1944, or 1957? No Googling, we'll reveal the answer after the next segment. Is there a world beyond data compliance? If so, how do I get there? 
Pat Shanahan and Clarissa Lucas from Nationwide Insurance have a roadmap to help internal auditors travel beyond data compliance to effective governance of data assets while gaining buy-in across their organization. Um, so in your presentation, Pat, you know that the volume of data being collected is just enormous nowadays. Uh, tell me a little bit, give me a little perspective on that. Well, the point we're making is, as companies have evolved, uh, as the growth of data, companies have evolved along with that. And so they were only, companies, organizations were only worried about data they needed to solve a business process or run a business process. And now they're thinking about data that's available to them in so many different ways. Um, social media, there's an opportunity to connect with customers in ways we never thought of before. And even with um, uh, our core platforms, we didn't think about things like cell phone and emails for direct communication. So organizations are thinking very differently about that with the mass explosion of data that's available to them today. And, it, and that's so technology driven, whether it's 5G or, or, or AI or anything else that, that may be able to, to pull in data. Um, I'm, I'm trying to give folks an, an idea of just how massive that can be. I mean, we're talking about, you know, no longer talking about gigabytes, we're talking about terabytes. There's no doubt there's a ton of uh, data available. Uh, the data governance component was trying to figure out what do we, how do we manage that for strategic initiatives? That's what we call it, strategic differentiation. And so part of it is it doesn't really matter how much is out there because you're not going to use it all. And so what we wanted to start with is helping companies think about what are those strategic enablers that they're looking for. Uh, we talked about benefits like new distribution channels or increased increase revenue streams, um, reducing their operational, um, or creating operational efficiency, reducing overall risks, and data both internally and externally, internally can help companies do that. Yeah, because you ask in your presentation, why, why should we care? And that's, that's part of the answer. That's right. That it why, can help you in so many different ways. Why should we care? And there's a lot of articles written. We, we put a headlines up there, a number of articles written talking about there's a real sense of urgency for companies to invest time to create a data governance strategy. But it is critical to have that strategy in place because you can't just go at it. I mean, you need to understand what what is what are the elements that need to be in place. Well, we we spent some time in the presentation. Uh, we used a Maslow hierarchy uh, visual, which I love. It it helps people think about uh, your lower tiers, creating that solid foundation. We spent a lot of time talking about that solid foundation. Now, every organization is going to have to figure out what that means for themselves. Uh, but once you create that foundation, then you can build those components on there. And so we talked about items such as making sure you know what your inventory is, um, and both internally and externally. What ecosystems are you a part of outside of your organization? Uh, the other thing we talked about in that foundation layer is you're not going to like all the answers you, you find. Right. But now you know, and now you can take action on those, on those items. And, and you make an important differentiation between what is data protection, data uh, compliance, and then data governance. And your focus is on data governance. That's exactly right. Uh, in, again, in the presentation, we talked about compliance and protection as defense. So you, those are things we have to do as an organization. Nobody wants to be the next company on the headline for uh, either being out of compliance or having lost mass amounts of data. But those aren't driving those enablers. They're not driving new strategic initiatives for the organization. Data governance is. Uh, and so having those components in place allows you to go after those items that we just mentioned. Yeah. And having that important understanding of objectives and risks when it comes to that data governance is where internal audit can step in and, and serve as, as a strong support for that. Tell me a little bit about that, Clarissa. Yeah, we can definitely, as internal auditors, serve as that strong support. What I really wanted the audience to walk away with was that they can, even if they're not auditors, they can become auditors for a minute and use that audit mindset. Um, you know, understanding what is the organization trying to achieve as far as overall objectives, and then what are some of those data-related objectives as well. Then taking the next step and understanding what are the risks. So for auditors, this is second nature, this is just what we do. Not everyone else in the organization thinks of things in terms of those objectives and risks. Understanding what those data-related objectives and risks are, and then prioritizing those to, to identify where should you be spending your data governance calories? 
that's really a first step, a great first step, and found one of the foundational elements that Pat talked about. So is, is it hard to get that stakeholder buy-in, or, or is their, their understanding of, of risk and risk management helpful here? If they understand risks and risk management, that's incredibly helpful. But we know that not everyone speaks that language every day. They're more focused on what they're trying to accomplish, and risk language is sometimes uh, not not their first their first uh, thought. So partnering with auditors uh, and, and other lines as well. So for second and third line, that partnership is incredibly important to help bring that risk mindset and have people start understanding what the risks truly are. I mean, uh, one would think that for, particularly from a board level, their focus may be on you know not getting into trouble, keep me out of trouble. So it's a lot of focus on more of the regulation side, mm -hmm. uh, like you, we talked about earlier. Is it hard to steer them back to a, the big picture of, of data governance? If you've got data governance covered, the rest will fall into place. Is that fair? It, it is fair, and that's why I go back to uh, determining what it is you're trying to do, and you can get your board aligned with that as a strategic initiative, and then the data components will follow. Doing it just to do it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it is, when we talked about this in the presentation, it is an enabler for items that are likely on most companies' uh, strategic path, like your AI machine learning um, journey and path, um, your, um, we call it this uh, intentional personalization. And so trying to get to know our customers on a much more deeper level than we've ever done before. Customers expect it and we want to do it. Uh, when we know them better, then we can find the next solution to help them protect what matters most. And so the data governance allows you to do those and the board should be very excited and interested in those types of things. So are there any clear biggest roadblocks to, to effective data governance beyond you know, the education process? There's a ton of them. Tell me about those. Well, first of all, it's hard. Uh, for any organization that's been around you, you know, I think about data as uh, you know the closet that just gets filled up over time. You're not exactly sure what's in there, so you have to you have to clean it up. It needs some care and feeding. Uh, you just mentioned sponsorship. Uh, and this is an interesting space where everybody owns it. When everybody owns it, nobody owns it, and so you need these champions at the top mm -hmm. that are saying that this is important. This is what we're doing. And that's where we should have board level support. That type of top of the house. Um, unclear roles and responsibilities. Uh, in our presentation, we asked that one of the challenges and, um, and then one another poll question we asked is who owns it? And uh, more than one audience member said, we don't know. And so right there, you're starting from a, a big challenge, figuring out who is driving this initiative. Is it about building a, a sort of a data analytic culture uh, that, or data governance culture? That, that basically works its way across the organization? Yeah, we talked about culture in there as well and being, uh, being focused on the why. Again, um, without anchoring back to something, it's just gonna slip back into old patterns and old behaviors. And so uh, people have to see that what they're doing is connected to something bigger than themselves. Right, it's not just widget making. It's, that's it's, right. it's, there's a purpose to all this. That's exactly right. All right. And that's why aligning back to those objectives, the organization-wide objectives, is, is important. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. It's been great uh, chatting with you folks. Thank you. Robert, uh, thanks for having us. Absolutely. Okay, here's the answer to the In Focus Challenge, which was to identify the year the award-winning Internal Auditor magazine began publication. The choices were 1972, 1964, 1957, and the correct answer, 1944. The profession has changed greatly over the years, but this publication remains an enormous benefit to members of the IIA. I am Hossein al -Kirsch. I work in internal audit and quality assurance, and two of my favorite hobbies are photography and travel. Usually in, uh, in internal audit reports, sometimes we use actually some photos to illustrate our point of view or to explain uh, uh, a certain situation. Fortunately, my work in internal audit gave me the chance to fulfill these two hobbies while working. The art of photography, from my point of view, is about capturing a, a certain moment. And to do so, uh, usually I take uh, many photos for the same shot or for the same scene 
to make sure that I got the, 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 the perfect moment. I especially like uh, landscape photography uh, and uh, natural scenes uh, because uh, this type of photography uh, uh, reveals the beauty of nature. This is one of my favorite photos. I took it during my trip to Philippines. Uh, it's one, it shows the degradation of colors during sunset and shows the silhouette of a boat, which makes uh, uh, for me I, 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 one of my favorite photos. This is another photo that I took during my trip to Philippines and it shows a, a degradation of color of a lake with uh, certain uh, boats uh, and uh, greenery scenes in the photo. This photo is quite different than other photos because it's not about natural landscape or uh, natural scenery. It's about a certain architecture details uh, and it shows uh, the, the beauty of architecture. Uh, I took this photo in Milan, in Italy. I took this photo in South Africa uh, for the Cape of Good Hope in Cape Town. I like this photo very much because it shows the shade of a cloud, a certain cloud. So the shade of the cloud actually is reflected. Two years ago in 2020, I was in a construction project, making an audit on the, of that project and uh, uh, I found a very uh, beautiful uh, scene for a marina yacht. So I decided to take a uh, few shots for that yacht. And, and then later I heard about a competition organized by the Egyptian State Ministry of Information. So I decided to uh, uh, enter the competition with this photo and I won. My wife Basma uh, bought me a professional uh, camera for my last year birthday and she encouraged me to take this hobby to the next level. She encouraged me to take a photography, a professional photography course, uh, but we agreed to postpone the course till I uh, finish my study for the Certified Internal uh, Auditor CIA exams, which I did and I passed the exams last May. So I think it's time to, to take the professional photography course. During the last two years, I had to minimize my travels because of COVID-19 but hopefully in the future, I'll be able to travel as much as I can and continue doing some wonderful photography. That's all for this month. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. If you'd like to enjoy an extended version of the discussions featured today, visit the IIA.org, where IIA members get access to a longer version of this episode with more information and insights on data governance and data analytics. And here's a discount for joining the IIA. You can save 20% off of standard membership with any of the codes listed on the screen and in the show description. Make your certification stick with CPEs. IIA certified individuals must report credits earned in 2022 by December 31st. There's still time to earn credits. Online opportunities range from one-hour webinars to 24-credit seminars to on-demand courses. Active certification holders can also opt into the IIA certification registry. To learn more about CPE requirements and the registry, visit www.theiia.org Promotions, Certifications, CPE. You can earn 6.6 .6 CPEs on December 8th during the Technology Trends Virtual Conference. This one-day conference will help you stay ahead of critical issues and be more responsive in your work. Use the coupon code TTVC22 to register and receive $50 off the member or non-member price. Thanks for joining us for all things internal audit from the IIA. We'll connect again soon.